So, um, yeah, we were talking about um, planetary spirits and specifically the solar spirits. Um, so I was uh, um, uh, saying that in ancient times, so in uh, Hellenic, Hellenic Greek culture and also pre-Hellenic culture, um, people believed that every uh, planet had uh, two spirits, one, fe uh, one male and one female, who taught us how to work with those aspects of our being. And later this system was changed to remove the uh, female uh, aspects of the, of the planets as society became more martial and patriarchal. Um, what happened after that is that uh, people started to have astral journeys, especially in the 18th century and 19th century there was a lot of exploration done. And they came up with very different numbers of uh, planetary spirits who resided or who guided us in working with these um, uh, planetary bodies. And the number of spirits which, according to these researchers, uh, govern every uh, planet is quite differing. Um, so the Sun is said to have uh, six planetary spirits. Okay. Yeah? Are you my own? Yeah, I hear you. Maar ik hoor jou heel slecht. Okay. Ik kan bijna niet woorden verstaan. Okay, I, I'll put back the other microphone then. Okay, um, is this better, Ninka? Bedankt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so these, because um, um, later these researchers, they started to look um, a little bit more in depth at the, uh, at the planets instead of just considering the uh, astrological aspects of the self so that they saw um, the male and the female spirits as being representative of the male and female aspects of our own personalities uh, but they started to see the planets as conduits rather for um, greater cosmic powers um, and especially the Sun as the, the major planetary body um, is seen as the, the gateway um, and also the guiding, uh, the guiding power for all the other planets and also for the communication between our solar system and other solar systems. Um, I don't know exactly from the top of my head all the aspects of the, of the solar angels. Um, one of them was uh, the life-giving aspect, um, the other one was the healing aspect, the harmonizing aspect, uh, the consciousness uh, development. Um, so that's four out of six, I would have to look it up. Um, and most other planets have between one and three uh, planetary spirits. Um, by actually uh, leaving the physical body and making contact with the, um, in a way the, the flow of energy between you and the planet, you can also find out what uh, planetary spirits are actually trying to guide you or are manifesting themselves through you. In uh, working with um, solar rituals, We tend to focus a lot on um, working with the, with the seasons and also the, the symbology of light. Uh, the return of the light in the winter, the um, light reaching its maximum power in the summer and the balance between light and darkness um, during the equinox. Um, the solar rituals were uh, also used a lot in 
uh, triggering uh, temples and holy places where the light of, um, for instance, the equinox or the uh, solstice would uh, strike a certain point in the temple or uh, in some Egyptian temples. Uh, there's actually a series of gods and goddesses and as the light moves also the light falls on different gods and goddesses so that the temple is devoted or uh, in a way a different god or deity is empowered uh, to use the temple at different times of the year. Um, what we find is that in these different times of the year the processes in, on, yeah, at least on the northern and southern hemisphere um, they're very much dictated by, um, by the season. Uh, so a lot of these uh, celebrations are about attuning yourself to the flow which is happening naturally in the season. Um, the spring equinox is the, in a way the balance between light and darkness, but also it's to celebrate the, uh, the awakening of the light, the coming back to, of of life, everything will start moving again, everything will start growing again. Um, so it's very much the, the, in a way, the light of creation which is uh, celebrated here. Um, during the uh, summer uh, solstice, it is very much uh, the power, the strength of the light which is celebrated because the light is at its strongest, the earth is, is starting to be as warm as it can be, and uh, this is an optimal condition because of the uh, strong energies available to manifest yourself, to, to really, uh, not just to awaken, but really to manifest, to put things um, into the form, if you will. Um, the full equinox is again uh, a time of uh, stability, a balance between light and darkness. And the fall equinox is actually the time which is most suitable for, uh, for rituals, for uh, astral travelings. Um, because the light is still uh, has been present uh, for the past uh, six months, so there's a lot of light energy available. So also the energy body of the person is strong, but there's also a balance between light and darkness. And usually in balance points it is very easy to slip between borders to slip into other worlds and the same could be done also in the uh, spring equinox but then the energy body is not as fit or as strong so the traveling is more difficult. Um, so this is the uh, fall equinox is really also a time to perform initiations uh, both of the self and of objects. Uh, the winter equinox is really the time of stability, where uh, the light is at its weakest, the darkness is at its strongest, so we need to focus ourselves to stabilize ourselves and also to uh, prune away, to cut away everything which is unnecessary, all our illusions, all our wasteful habits, um, to purify ourselves. And by in a way going into the darkness, um, we can also focus on the light, on the little light which remains with us, instead of being distracted by all the darkness and all the dark thoughts and other things. So darkness is also uh, a very good time for, uh, for fasting, for concentration, can contemplation, meditation. And uh, the winter is also traditionally the time to tell stories, uh, to share knowledge, to share the inner light, the hidden light, because the outward light is, uh, has disappeared from us. Um, one of the um, uh, ways which, uh, uh, in which one can work with it is also to charge objects during the uh, summer solstice. Um, in the uh, Egyptian tradition people um, took the statues of the gods and goddesses out of the temple and often put them on the roof of the temple um, during the uh, uh, summer solstice. They left them there for about a week and during this week the, um, the statue of the god or goddess would absorb the solar impulse then they would take the statue back inside the temple which was generally windowless and dark but um, it would provide the, uh, the mystical light, the mystical flame 
for all the rituals and all the magic which was performed in the temple. Um, and these places on the, on the roofs of these Egyptian temples are incredibly powerful. Uh, so if you do visit, be a little bit cautious uh, if you try to connect to the solar impulse there. Um, also connecting to the solar impulse during the summer solstice can be a little bit dangerous. Um, I myself had did some experiment with that um, because I felt that there were many powers still sleeping, still slumbering in me. Um, powers or memories from previous incarnations, from previous lives. And um, I felt, well, maybe I can nurture them or give them a boost of this solar energy. And then I will speed up my spiritual development. And it worked, but that was also the problem that it worked. Um, so I created a, a, a temple, an enclosed space, and invited the solar impulse and put myself in it. So the solar impulse could connect to all these unconscious parts of myself. But because these parts were still unconscious, they were also uncontrolled by me. And as soon as they started to soak up this energy, they became very strong and very active. And so I became controlled very much by all these awakening fragments of my own subconscious. And I started to lose control over... Darling? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I started to lose control over, um, yeah, over my own thoughts, over my own perception, um, of my own emotions. So I started to drift into all kinds of other realities and becoming totally dissociated from my body. And fortunately there was a good friend of mine who yeah, was powerful enough to, yeah, in a way, take back those powers and stuff them back into their little unconscious containers. Um, because I might have ended up uh, quite insane if uh, it would have continued for yeah, much longer. Um, so the solar impulse is something to be a little bit wary of. Um, the solar impulse can also be used uh, very well for healing um, because it is seen as uh, a life-giving, so it is seen as the originator, the connection with, uh, with the powers of creation. Um, it is also seen as uh, healing and harmonizing. Um, the healing aspect and the harmonizing aspect seem to lie very close together, but the healing aspect is more of an internal aspect and the harmonizing aspect is more of an external aspect. Um, so the harmonizing impulse of the, of the solar is, um, aids a lot in, uh, in communication, in spreading knowledge um, from you to other people but also receiving the healing powers which are in the nature around you. Um, for instance, in the Maya tradition, they developed a healing system called Reikia, um, in which you also use the solar impulse, the light impulse, to ask all the plants and the animals to bring healing impulses to you, if they can. And so you make in way, contact with all the elements which are available in nature for a few miles uh, uh, radius and you use the solar impulse to bring all these energies to your body or to the body of the person you're healing and this is a very effective healing technique especially if you live in a very varied natural environment um, the harmonizing impulse is um, this is in a way also very similar. So in this Reiki technique you use the harmonizing impulse to transform it into a healing impulse. Um, the healing impulse itself has to do a lot with regulation. Um, our, we have a lot of cycles, we have a lot of rhythms in ourselves and they can be quite deregulated um, because of stress, because of ir just irregular lives, uh, because of confusion by pollutants. Um, and these can be both energetic pollutants and chemical pollutants um, or um, uh, uh, also just uh, radiation. Some people are very sensitive to that if they get too much 
electromagnetical radiation or magnetron waves, um, microwaves, they yeah, get very disturbed sleep patterns and other natural rhythms. And um, the sun has a very big regulating power and by actually applying light um, uh, yeah, to the skin but also to specific points on the meridians, uh, these meridian cycles can be reset. So this is also a way to work with the, with the solar impulse. And it's, it's quite effective, I have to say. Um, so when you are performing sun rituals, it is of course nice if you can see the sun, but it is not, um, it is not actually necessary. Um, because in a sun ritual, what you want to do is you want to connect your own inner sun with the outer sun, with its source. And the inner sun um, is usually uh, located either in the heart or in the Manipura chakra, the, the stomach chakra, depending whether the person is more using uh, the solar impulse to, um, to be dominant, to have authority, or uh, they use it to have a clear, um, a clear mind, a clear perception, a clear communication, then it is more in the heart. Uh, so it's important to note that it is not in the head. So the sun is very much associated with consciousness, but consciousness is very different from thought. And the thought processes and analysis and logic happens in the head, but the consciousness happens in the heart. Um, so during the sun ritual you focus on your own consciousness and you try to connect it to, in a way, the collective consciousness of our solar system. So this is not the human collective consciousness, but rather a greater collective consciousness, which includes the consciousness of all the planets, of all the animals and all the plants. Okay. Um, okay, someone else's mic is open. Okay, I think it is quiet now again. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, in the sun rituals, um, you really want to, to, to work with the, with the consciousness impulse. So this is very much the realization of, uh, of what exists, uh, not just what exists within yourself, which exists in your conscious mind or your subconscious mind, but what exists just in our uh, in our universe. Hi, can you the other person turn on the mic? Or I hear a lot of people talking through your talk. It's a bit annoying. Thank you. Zinta, do you have the mic on? <laughs> Can you turn it off, please? Okay. Okay, it seems to be quiet now again in the background. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Um, so we are working with the consciousness um, and uh, during a sun ritual it is um, a very good time also to try to harmonize all the aspects of your consciousness with the collective consciousness of other beings but also with your own collective consciousness. Uh, so it's a very good time for self-observation and in a way gathering all the other planetary influences at that time to see how they are balanced. So to look at all your planetary aspects and also to look at all the uh, aspects of the fixed stars because your planetary aspects will be in certain uh, signs of the zodiac 
and um, during sun rituals it's also possible to work with these zodiac signs because also their energies are a lot easier to perceive. Uh, so this heightened consciousness really helps us in our own energetic sensitivity and our ability to, uh, to realize our own position um, where we are in this, uh, in this uh, cycle of the zodiac because in all our processes we go through the cycle of the zodiac so we start with, um, uh, with the uh, young fire impulse and move slowly to the old water impulse in, in Pisces and um, during any of these uh, sun rituals um, you can have a look at all aspects of your life, uh, your work, your relationship, your spiritual development, your artistic development, your um, social skills and just see at what stage that you are uh, at that time and also to see what are the blockages or which are the stages which are strong or which are weak. So a sun ritual is very a time when actually it's very easy to look into the mirror to re really realize um, what's really going on because the connections between you and all the other things can be felt much more easily. Um, so in the context of civilization of human beings, it is often uh, that in these um, uh, sun rituals uh, they would uh, choose an activity um, because the, the people uh, performing the sun ritual uh, often did this as a community. And so the community as a whole would look in the mirror, look at itself to see where they were at and what they were doing. And then to realize in what is the rest of nature doing, what is the rest of the world doing, the rest of the cosmos doing. And they would try to fit in with that process, to try to harmonize themselves with the flow of the world, with the flow of the cosmos. And by doing so, um, the cosmos could guide them in a better way. They would enjoy a better contact with the various gods and powers and natural forces and spirit guides. Um, so in a way it is kind of a, a, a realignment between themselves and all the other powers and um, often during these uh, times they would also start great works um, so the, to start the foundation of a city or the building of a temple um, or any great expeditions uh, they were often done uh, especially during such moments um, later they were re replaced uh, when Christianity became more dominant by Easter um, but Easter is also uh, in a way in more pagan culture very much also the, the spring ritual the fertility ritual so uh, and it was it used to be celebrated a little bit earlier <laughs> um, really at the beginning of the year which according to the old calendars is in March and uh, not in January uh, also the Egyptian calendars, they already used calendars of 365 days uh, starting in March uh, when actually the, uh, the first sign of the zodiac, the Aries, the Ram, um, would align with the Sun. Uh, it was in a way partially copied by the Roman conquerors but they ch started to change things around to make the months uneven and eventually it started also in a different month. But the old calendar is really in tune with the uh, energetic uh, rhythms. Uh, nowadays uh, people are starting to use the Maya calendar. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Maya calendar but I'm told it also works quite well. Uh, because the Mayas also had a lot of knowledge of, uh, of cosmic rhythms. The Mayas actually use a lot of uh, different cycles of different planets and uh, different stars so they have uh, literally dozens of calendars uh, which they can combine into various systems while the um, Egyptian system is a purely solar system um, there are also moon calendars which use 13 moons um, which are also quite useful because in the same way as the Sun can set yeah, specific times for starting and, and finishing uh, processes 
the moon does it also, but um, in a way much more frequently. Um, and it is not so much uh, the great works which are started by moon calendars, but it is very much the, uh, the working with the unconscious, um, which, the, which really follows the lunar cycle. So if you want to work with uh, subconscious powers, if you want to do mystical work, if you want to do some magical work, um, if you want to work with your emotions, if you want to work with um, things which have died, if you want to work with your own traumas, then it's very good to use the lunar cycles for this rather than the solar cycles. Because this is a process which actually should be done quite regularly. Um, the lunar cycle also has a, a healing aspect and a consciousness aspect, just like the, uh, the sun cycle. Um, what you see in, in using the, the, um, the lunar aspect is that it is, um, because most lunar rituals are done at night, so the, the essential symbolism of it is to look for the light in the darkness um, rather than just to bathe yourself in light. Uh, so it often has a much more uh, introspective aspect while the sun often has a more outward aspect. Um, so lunar uh, rituals are also very good to work with, uh, with dreams and also with um, uh, family connections. Not so much with, with bigger connections in, in society, but the more intimate connections uh, can also be worked with really well in, uh, in lunar rituals. Um, about the egregores which are involved in, the, in these rituals. Um, it is relatively safe to, to do egregorial attunements uh, during, um, during solar festivals. Um, because by inviting the, the solar powers, you in a way are inviting the highest authority in our solar system to be present. And that means that usually powers who do not want to uh, conform to this authority they usually yeah, try to stay away from such rituals or from solar temples. Um, so that doesn't mean that by definition only light egregores will participate or will be present during a, a solar ceremony. But it means that the dark egregores which are present or which are active um, are in a way there for a very good reason. They're there to teach us, to show us something, they're, part, they're an essential part of the uh, development of consciousness within our solar system. Um, so it is very much uh, a, a safe environment to do egregorial attunements. And if you find that certain egregores are uh, ill-inclined to show up or to work uh, during uh, these uh, solar rituals, that's basically showing that uh, probably in t at the present time or in the present place or culture or setting that they feel they are not appropriate. Um, so it is also very nice to see uh, what inspiration you can get from the solar spirits to make these egregorial invitations or attunements. I will move now to uh, the next question. It is about developing long will and uh, devoting to God. Um, yes, the, the question here is uh, that it is feels very strange uh, to uh, pray to a personalized form, which feels very odd. Um, it is also indeed not, uh, not necessary. Um, what, uh, what exists are powers and um, these powers are in a way uh, neutral by nature. They just exist, they just move, they just are. 
Um, and it is possible for a person to work directly with this, with this formless power. Um, because in a way your own uh, spirit in its enlightened state, or your own soul in its enlightened state, is higher than the power. So it is possible for your, yeah, your essence to work with all these powers and to, to control them and to manifest them. Uh, but to do this, in a way you have to act out of the consciousness of your, of your spirit, of your soul. And if you act out of the consciousness of your ego, then it will not be possible really to listen or to communicate with these powers. And it is as exactly because most people are in a, in a state of consciousness which is controlled by their ego, um, and not by their spirit, that they often have a struggle with lots of powers, with lots of energies, trying how to work with them, trying to, to control them. Um, and it is because of, in a way, the forgetfulness which occurs when the spirit goes into the body and forms the ego, which even to a greater degree blocks the consciousness of the spirit, that we need uh, gods and goddesses to remind us of the power and to, in a way, um, teach us again how to work with it in our specific form, because our spirit can work with it, but often the spirit has little experience in working with them in a human form, because uh, war means something different to an ant or to a bee than it does to a human. So there's always a little bit of a translation depending on, uh, on what form you take. But if the consciousness of the spirit is high enough, um, or the incarnated consciousness is, is high enough, then um, all the other aspects are in a way inherently available or inherently controllable by the, um, by the incarnated being. And then there is no need for a god or a goddess, but there is a need to uh, connect to that power, because that power will, wants to manifest, it wants to change the world, it wants to work with you. And often we bring these connections, um, we have with these powers either in the personalized form of a god or goddess or in the uh, uh, formless form of a power uh, with us, especially to work with them. Um, it's also interesting to note that also animals and plants also have gods and goddesses. So for them also there is a kind of an intermediate uh, being or stage uh, which manifests uh, the power which is cosmic on a local level. Um, so what you see is that many of the gods and goddesses they come into existence in a way to serve uh, a specific race of beings and these can be humans but they can also be other beings and um, these gods and goddesses are sometimes active in multiple solar systems taking care of uh, several species of beings in these various solar systems, but sometimes they're also very localized. Um, also different uh, people tend to focus or use powers in a different way, which leads to a different projection of what the power is like or should be like or what the goddess is or should be like. Uh, usually the gods and goddesses have very little um, interest in how people choose to view them or choose to see them. They just use the creations which are basically astral projections. So if I think that uh, the god of strength is a man with a beard who rides uh, yeah, um, on, a, on a chariot drawn by goats and throws a hammer which creates thunder and lightning, well if I create such an image of the god of strength then the power or the god will use that image to communicate with me. And if I think of her as a woman riding a tiger, well, then that god or goddess will yeah, contact me in that form. Uh, so often the gods and goddesses don't really care very much about the images we humans create. Um, it is just that if we have a strong um, uh, relationship with the culture, then working with that image becomes very natural for us. Uh, and we. Yeah, in a way can read the symbolism very easily of what they're doing, how they're showing themselves, 
Do they have a black skin, do they have a white skin, a green skin, a blue skin? All these things can be very important symbols uh, when, you, when a god or a goddess presents themselves uh, to you. And it's kind of a, a language uh, to work with, uh, with the incarnated person. Um, what also is, uh, is interesting is um, that depending on the culture and therefore also the relationship within that culture with the power, um, it tends to limit very much the, the, the contact or the consciousness which can be transferred by working with that god or the goddess. Um, it can also be quite tricky because certain uh, cultures or more uh, in the Satanic Cosmos, more in the Lucifer Cosmos, or more in the Arimanic Cosmos. And if you have a certain nature, it is very important to find gods or goddesses who are in a way native to your own cosmos, rather than find ones which are culturally appropriate to you. Um, Working with the power in a, um, in a depersonalized form uh, is also possible, but then we in a way have to uh, dehumanize ourselves. Um, because the powers are greater than our, um, our personality construct, which we can, uh, can generate. Um, <coughs> so, the... Um, The working also with, with the power in this depersonalized form is usually also working on a more essential level, on a more um, immaterial level. So in general, if a person wants to work with the essence of the power, they are working really with the life path, with the, um, uh, or with the society, or with the species as a whole, or with the location as a whole. Usually if a person is working for more limited goals, like, okay, I want to have some guidance or I want to help someone, um, it's, they, people tend not to go through the effort of really depersonalizing, going back to the power and repersonalizing. Because often it is uh, quite difficult to translate uh, the neutral position of the power into the desires of which are very temporal and very local and very focused. Uh, so this is a way in which uh, working with gods and goddesses, but also with saints um, who, for, who have a very similar function, uh, can help to work on a, on a personal level. But definitely if you want to work on a collective level, then uh, you need to work with a in a depersonalized manner. You cannot work on great collective issues while still yeah, seeing the god or being limited to seeing the God on a, on a personalized level. Uh, you can, you in a way have to realize that in a way the power manifests itself as a whole group of gods and goddesses in different solar systems and that in a way the power exists both as an abstract uh, formless power but also as crystallized into the different gods and goddesses. So, um, yes, the question is about developing the long will. So one of the, the methods I, uh, I told about was indeed um, devoting yourself to a god or a goddess or some ideal or principle, joining an egregore. Um, and uh, the question is, um, if the soul is the perfect blueprint of the spirit's development in the eon, uh, is it possible to devote to your own spirit? Or would this be ineffective or misleading? Or is any other higher or lighter consciousness suitable? Well, the problem is actually that it is too high, not that it is too low. Um, because in the, in the same way as I, um, in a way our, our essence 
is higher than all the powers in the universe. It can use and connect with all the powers in the universe. But um, therefore there is no focus, there is no desire, there is no will because everything is already available, everything is already existing. Um, and willpower is very much about discipline, about focus, about limitation. And it's in a way, um, you sacrifice part of the harmony, part of your freedom uh, to gain power, to gain control, to gain experiences. Um, and this is kind of a, a strange process because uh, we feel that uh, spiritual development is a process of indeed gaining a higher perspective and gaining more freedom and less attachment and in that the long will is uh, counterintuitive um, but we have to understand that it is a cycle only by in a way having experiences experimenting and learning um, we can develop the wisdom and the, the skills to uh, to go to higher states of consciousness to create kind of meta consciousness higher meta, meta patterns which allow us to uh, to grow into more complex beings, into more harmonized beings. And uh, developing the long will is basically saying that uh, uh, you are going to focus yourself and stabilize yourself in a lower uh, realm for a while um, to really become a master of one aspect of, uh, of life or of existence. And by working with the long will uh, it actually is possible to take that, yeah, that knowledge or that skill you build up through various incarnations and also into other solar systems. These are very deep skills, very deep knowledge which you get because it's also a very deep sacrifice which you make uh, by committing yourself. It's like a vow, uh, an oath that you will uh, do this until you become a master. And often to become a master takes a little bit over 20 incarnations in general, human incarnations. So this is kind of like the, yeah, the level of commitment or investment you're talking about. Um, so unfortunately, um, yeah, your own spirit is, uh, um, is too high and the same is, is true also for uh, enlightened masters, enlightened spirits, uh, who also are above all these powers. Um, but gods and goddesses are limited, so therefore they can function. Uh, you can also devote yourself uh, to an archetype. So the monk, the hero, the martyr, uh, the mother, um, and by um, archetypes are in a way a mix between uh, a combination of powers. So devoting to an archetype is in a way more difficult, uh, more trying than working with just one, uh, one god or one goddess. And it's often also a lot more prone to failure. People who are in a way focused on one archetype or devote themselves to one archetype, uh, they often get lost in the complexity of fulfilling that role in so many different aspects, in so many different cultures and often they lose their way. Um, so, yeah, in a way, the god or the goddess is, is simpler than archetype. It is also possible to devote oneself to um, working with an egregore. And um, the egregore is in a way similar to the archetype, that it also works with various powers, um, but because the egregore inherently has a lot of knowledge and experience and also already the transmutation of all this experience into a higher state of consciousness within itself, uh, there's a lot less risk of getting lost than working with the archetype, uh, which is just a collective consciousness instead of really a focused collective consciousness which is supported by a more solid structure, a more solid hierarchy of beings, as is present within an egregore. Uh, so you can just pick an ideal, find the appropriate egregore, and if the egregore is old enough and well-developed enough, 
um, that can also help you to develop this, uh, this long will and to stabilize you over various incarnations. Um, the working with the long will uh, in connection with uh, an egregore takes longer than working with just a god or a goddess because on the one hand uh, you're working with various powers and um, that makes it more complex so you need more time to learn. The other thing is that the egregore often has very specific needs. It needs you to do this or to do that or to take no incarnation or take a certain type of incarnation. So you're not only focused on working with the power, on discovering the power, on serving the power, but yeah, you often get distracted with helping other members of the egregore or fighting for the egregore against its enemies or other distractions. So in general, working with an egregore uh, it's an investment of usually closer to 80 incarnations rather than the 20 it would take when you're working uh, with a god or goddess. Because a god or goddess in a way essentially has no opposition. Um, it just has a purpose, it has a goal. Uh, so you can move forward a lot more easily uh, rather than get into a whole tug of war with all kinds of other powers who are trying to control the development of consciousness in a mix of light and dark. Okay, um, there was indeed uh, uh, a very interesting other option which is mentioned here. Um, it is to work with uh, an alien race. And that's yeah a very a very beautiful option I have to say. Um, because in a way an, an alien race, an alien culture uh, can be seen as in a way as an egregore. There are also a, a group who was working towards a specific goal and who has learned to master certain powers. Um, what we see in a way in, in humans is that we as, as humans have a very dim concept of what is our purpose as, uh, as human, as human beings, as incarnated beings. And uh, the individuals which are part of humanity are often not serving the whole or performing uh, the role which we should perform as a race. And this, in a way, disharmony, uh, disobedience is also reflected internally. We have a lot of internal fights, internal struggles. Um, we really uh, fight with ourselves, we hurt ourselves, we don't know ourselves. And the same is true within our collective consciousness. It's not a very helpful place. But the collective consciousness of uh, certain other uh, species, other races, is very different uh, from that. And um, compared to egregores, there is not so much of a fight or of a struggle because there is no opposition. The culture is more monolithic. It is a whole and the whole people want to be in a certain way. They are aware of their goal, of their purpose in the universe. And they carry it out rather than the tug of war we have here on, on our earth. Um, and therefore working with the collective consciousness of an alien race, I think it could be a very, very nice experience and it's probably also a very... Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it would immediately lead to the development of a, of a long will, um, because I don't have personal experience with that and I haven't seen any examples of that either. Um, I have seen it in, in a larger aspect of, uh, of cultures working together with an alien culture. And um, what I do notice there of the spirits who were deeply involved in this, in this process is that they move back and forth easily and they are very devoted to bringing the blessings of that culture to uh, the, the manifestation of that culture on our earth, on our planet and creating 
places of knowledge, places of initiation and in a way antennas for those um, higher impulses out of uh, yeah, this alien collective consciousness. Um, and in this case of the Pleiadians, I think it would work because the Pleiadians are uh, in a way uh, innovative people but besides being innovative they are, are a very uh, dedicated, very dutiful people um, and among their race there is a very strong remembrance of their previous forms and uh, so they tend to possess a long will quite naturally and I think they can aid us in developing it ourselves. So now there is the practical question of how to join with the Pleiadian collective consciousness. Hmm. Well, um, there are a, a number of uh, numerous methods. Um, one of the less nice methods I will start with, not for you to follow, but just to illustrate. Um, so you can build a temple and in this temple you can build uh, a ladder like uh, similar to the golden ladder but then not really reaching all the way to the absolute but reaching specifically um, to that star. Uh, the Egyptians built such structures but also in uh, middle America also such structures were built. Um, and often in the building of such a structure they uh, incorporated the energies of various levels of consciousness so that the person could step all the way from the beginning all the way to the top. So they used to bind the consciousnesses of uh, plants, stones, animals, uh, humans and uh, not of course just normal humans but often even great kings and high priests to yeah, develop a complete bridge into uh, this higher consciousness. So it is possible to build such a bridge uh, but rather than building it I think it would be easier to use an existing bridge rather than sacrificing lots of humans and kings, queens and priests <laughs> to do so. Um, so it's quite an investment for a culture to do something like that but I think it's no longer appropriate since we are a lot more in an individualized time where we don't build things for our entire culture anymore. Um, so another method to do it is to um, in a way allow um, to ask allowance from the solar spirits. So the solar spirits and the uh, uh, the egregore of uh, Orion, they're the gatekeepers a little bit to other solar systems. Um, so you could uh, go into a trance, leave your body, uh, unite it with the energy body of the Sun, and the Sun is in communication with all these other stars. Then being one with the Sun, so you become really one with your own solar aspect, so you really have to use your heart in, uh, in getting out of your physical body and to get into the right energy level uh, because you can leave your, uh, uh, your physical body and end up in many different uh, energetic configurations but you really need to end up in a solar configuration and so once you've joined your energy body with the energy body of the Sun you can request that you are taken uh, to Orion or to the egregore of Orion, which is kind of a central star, and from there you can be taken to the Pleiades. You can also go directly to the Pleiades, because we fortunately have a direct connection between our Sun and the Suns of the Pleiades. Um, so the detour is not necessary, but um, 
it can be that they would like you to do something or they want to impose some limitations or they want to have some checks on you so this is kind of like the uh, the customs office you could say also not to bring the wrong energies there uh, or to get in trouble um, but in the same way um, uh, if you have been there once you can also invite a spirit or you can hope to find a spirit in within the solar body which is originating from that system um, so those are ways to, to get into contact. Um, but actually to become part of the collective consciousness is a little bit more difficult. Uh, because once your spirit is there in the Pleiades, it has to uh, manifest downward into one of their energetic bodies, in one of their configurations, and then upward again into their collective consciousness. So in a way you have to incarnate as a solar spirit, so you're no longer a human, but you are a solar spirit who takes possession temporarily or permanently of one of the, their energy bodies. So you incarnate, if you will, as a Pleiadian. And then as a Pleiadian you raise your consciousness to become part of their collective consciousness. And out of this collective consciousness you can go back as a solar consciousness to your own physical body. So it is um, a little bit of a complex maneuver to do. Um, but I think it's quite well doable uh, because the Pleiadians are, their natural consciousness is already quite solar. They are a very conscious, very aware people. Um, so the change is not as big as it would be with the various other alien races. Um, I'm thinking what are other methods. Other methods are of course to in a way um, go up to your, um, uh, to your higher self, to your spirit and to create another manifestation. So to create a new incarnation within the Pleiadian system. Uh, so you are at the, then at the same time living in the Pleiades as a Pleiadian and living as a human here on earth. And then to connect uh, uh, through your higher consciousness these two different lives so that uh, experiences and knowledge can flow from one part of your being into another part of your being. This is not always allowed especially in our solar system because of karma but if the Lords of Karma would give you permission this could also be an option and I know for a fact that there are various people who live like that and bring knowledge to our solar system in that fashion so that's another option to use. Um, given that, yeah, to do a ritual like this, it would be good to do it during the the solar equinox probably. Um, best would probably be the, the fall equinox when your body is charged with the, with the solar, solar impulse. You can try to do it in the, in the spring equinox as well but that's more difficult. Um, if you try it in a place which already is a solar temple that should help. Um, because the solar impulse is there quite strong, so that helps you to at least unite with the sun. how to prepare for such a, um, such a journey. Um, well, uh, step one will basically be that uh, none of your other uh, uh, planetary attachments, which in a way limit your energy body to the solar system, should stop you. So in a way you need to have a good relationship with all the other planetary aspects, so your whole personality needs to be um, um, enough aware or enough controlled 
by your spirit so you can escape this solar system if there are still in a way lessons to be learned or a lot of lessons to be learned in the solar system it is impossible uh, to leave this solar system to, to get into touch with other things so in a way you're stuck in a class and unless you can pass the the exit exam you cannot move to the next class this is how solar systems work not just our solar system but pretty much every solar system so generally the beings who which move from one solar system to another are already on the top of the class or they've learned what there is to learn within that solar system um, there is of course a way to cheat um, there is a, a uh, in a way, a goddess, Paramrita, she is called, and she controls the space between the stars and between the planets. She is, in a way, the essence of the void, the essence of emptiness, out of which everything is created. And by working with Paramrita, um, you can also, in a way, um, dissolve yourself and uh, come back in another place. Um, so that's another technique to use. Um, it's a, lot, a little bit more uh, tricky because it's rather difficult to work with emptiness and to dissolve yourself and still have the focus, the self-remembrance and the willpower to re-manifest yourself. Um, so it's a little bit tricky and people can end up quite dazed and often dazed for weeks when they try to work with Paramrita energies without yeah, the proper initiation or the proper connection to, uh, to the goddess to guide them in this process of uh, yeah, creation and uh, destruction. Uh, it is also reflected of course in, in Brahma and um, in, uh, in Shiva. But Paramrita really is the goddess which combines the two in one. So let's, I'll type the name. Also in Western culture people tend to be a little bit afraid of the void or nothing or destruction or limbo. Um, but in a way it is just a natural state of the cosmos before creation. It is not something to be worried about or afraid about. But in Asiatic cultures this is accepted much more easily than in, uh, in modern Western culture. Um, it's, it can also be, it's also seen as the, the cosmic ocean. Uh, in, in which, in way, on which the Creator God floats, and um, out of the dreams and the actions of the Creator God, the universe comes forward. Uh, so we're in a way all little fragments of the dreams of the Creator, floating in the ocean of Paramrita. That's by going back into the ocean and coming out of it again. Um, yeah, we can bypass uh, lots of. Yeah, blockages and restrictions and the other way is of course in a way to, to follow the system of creation um, and to yeah, uh, gain such a state of harmony and balance uh, that we can pass all the guardians at the threshold and uh, move out and um, very good meditations for this are in a way meditations where you invite all the fragments of your being uh, to come forward and to harmonize them. So harmonize all your chakras, harmonize your meridians, harmonize your social relationships with the world. Um, these are also very good uh, preparations and often essential preparations uh, to elevate your energy so it can become high enough to really join with the solar impulse. Because out of any conflict and any yeah, friction our vibration tends to become lower, more limited, um, so that's, yeah. Um, so
so that could help to uh, to prepare um, so I will try to rush through two more questions <laughs> so we don't build up too much of a backlog. <laughs> um, so the next question is if I could uh, tell us a little bit about... Can I interrupt? <laughs> oh, yes? <laughs> um, about uh, persons who travel through uh, different solar systems um, I was wondering uh, if you would meet someone here on Earth who uh, is very good at that. Um, I refer to an experience that when I looked inside someone's eyes, I could see the whole universe, completely star systems, etc. Is it something uh, referring to a solar traveler person or is it something completely different? Uh, do you know that experience? Uh, yes, it's also been uh, uh, been described in, in, in various uh, uh, books actually, the experience of seeing other solar systems, other planets or even the entire universe uh, in another person. Um, it is... Um, th th there are two aspects to it. Um, one of them is um, the, the, it can be a quality both of the person who sees but also of the person who is seen. So this is not immediately uh, clear. Um, so if it is about the person uh, um, who is seen, um, uh, a person has of course uh, energies of all different levels. Um, but generally uh, the more subtle energies are invisible to, uh, to other people. But um, in some people, the, uh, these subtle energies, they are very strong, they are very present, so that even though the other people are generally not sensitive enough to see them because of their radiance, uh, they can be seen. Uh, it is also possible that they can manifest these higher consciousness and lower it so that in a symbolic form uh, uh, it can be seen um, by people uh, observing them. Um, so if it is about the person who is seen, it usually tells something about either the person has a lot of energy on a high level uh, or they uh, have a very open connection to uh, a high level of energy or they have the ability to manifest that, uh, uh, that impulse which they are in a way bringing to the earth. So it can also be very much about the person who has a very strong mission. Um, if it is about the person who does the, uh, the seeing, um, it is uh, also said that of, of like, like people who reach a certain state of consciousness that they can see uh, the previous incarnations of all, uh, of all people and they can see even uh, the creator or the relationship with the creator every uh, person's soul has. Um, so this experience of, of uh, seeing uh, previous lives, previous incarnations or powers can also say something about you as the, as the perceiver. Um, generally for the, the person who does the perceiving, um, it indicates um, uh, a role where in which the, the essential relationship you have with that person is the relationship which is not with the person but with the, the God or the power or the principles which lie behind the person which the person is just a reflection of. Um, so for instance if uh, uh, um, I would meet somebody and I would see the Pleiades uh, in that person uh, that could mean that I have something to do with the Pleiades and therefore I recognize that person uh, because I want to work with this energy and they are representing that energy or manifesting the energy on, uh, on our planet. Um, so it can also be about the perceiver that it has uh, a message or a recognition sometimes 
of this is a person who is actually from the same background, from the same uh, star system as you yourself. Um, the, um, what can also happen is that it is not so much a perception of the other person, but an awakening of your own being. So it can be that the other person had incarnations in a, in a solar system or had dealings with a solar system in which you had incarnated before and that your memories from, that, uh, from those incarnations or your nature which is still or energies which you have in your subconscious from that solar system are awakened by the presence of that person and uh, rather than realizing that it is an inner power uh, it is perceived as an outer power um, so you see in a way it's in the person who awakens it in within you rather than realizing that it is within you that it is okay um, so the question is could I give some explanation about how to um, attune to powers from previous incarnations uh, So what is the reason that certain qualities are not always available in, uh, in certain incarnations? Well, uh, in general it is about the limitations of our consciousness um, and also the amount of, um, uh, of uh, because the human consciousness tends to be very linear. We are not very good at doing 10 things at the same time with equal amount of attention and intensity. And because of our linear nature, we have a limited amount of time and space available for manifestation. Uh, so ultimately, because there, there are limited means, we have to focus. If I want to be a, a great lover, a great athlete, a great leader, a great follower, a great artist, um, then usually one life is not enough. And um, we tend to choose uh, to focus on certain aspects rather than to try to do everything at the same time. Uh, another reason can be um, that although we learned certain powers and talents in that life, we misbehaved horribly while using those talents. And uh, those talents are blocked from us until we have uh, learned uh, from our past mistakes and we are not so likely to repeat our mistakes so that there is kind of a, a safety valve or a certain inner guardian which we have to uh, to appease before we allow ourselves to, to access to those powers um, so for instance in my own personal experience I used to block a lot of my own energetic talents especially my magical talents uh, because I was very afraid of my own anger. I felt my own anger was un imperfectly transformed and I would do things which are incorrect or not intended or evil and by, if I had my magical powers as well the effect would be compounded and I would actually lose my magical powers. So it was better not to use them than to lose them. <laughs> um, and that lasted until I gained enough transformation and light uh, so that I now feel more confident in uh, allowing myself to be angry uh, and trusting myself to be angry and without being blinded uh, by, my, by my anger and now I can allow myself to be more magical um, so this is one of the just an example of an inner guardian but there can also be outer guardians and these outer guardians can be either our previous victims who follow us around um, to prevent us from harming others like we harmed them uh, it can be the lords of karma or other uh, spiritual judges and their servants who keep certain powers from us uh, it can also be simple forgetfulness that we 
have a talent which we never have used or which was never called upon uh, in our lives and therefore remains uh, subconscious. Um, so one of the easiest ways to get in touch is in a way to do uh, regression therapy. But regression therapy also has that as a disadvantage that we can start to over-identify with powers from our past lives and thereby screw up our present life because we start reliving uh, things uh, we did before and reusing powers which are actually not uh, they're useful to our ego because we can it gives us power it gives us the ability to do things but it is useless to our spirit because we already have those experiences so in my case uh, I've led several incarnations uh, as, a, as a shaman and in this life I don't work that much with, uh, with shamanism because it is not a path my spirit wants to follow. It is now just a power I can use or not use as I desire, but I no longer study or really focus on shamanism. So, uh, indeed the powers which awaken from your past life, they can have a lot to do with indeed blockages and life goals. So one of the reasons also to, uh, uh, to block a certain talent um, is to, in a way, change your path. Um, so one person I know, um, he had many lives as a Xatria, as a fighter, so he became very used to using power, using talent, using his uh, knowledge, using his skills. And then he chose a life in which he was very sickly and was not very smart and um, uh, for them, him this was very frustrating and he became very angry at his life and his incarnation because he could remember, he could feel that all these powers were there and he wanted them back but also his spirit said like no because I'm becoming too prideful, I have no humility left, I don't know how to serve anyone anymore. Um, because the power becomes too domineering, it starts to dominate my consciousness and I need to prevent myself from falling into darkness. So, in a way, the ego and the spirit are in a very big struggle, in a very big fight, because the ego feels it's sick, it's weak, it's powerless and it needs the power to survive. But its own spirit won't let him have that power. Um, so these can be very interesting and very deep uh, problems. But ultimately it is about um, development of the spirit. If the spirit is strong enough, is wise enough, it can eventually uh, grow into mastery. So it is able to use whatever powers are part of its being without being limited by them, without being chained or misled or, uh, by these powers. Or uh, tricked or seduced by these powers. But yeah, becoming a master is much easier said than done. <laughs> um, yes, are these qualities stored somewhere? They are. Um, and these powers are stored uh, in, the, in, in several places. They are part of your... If you're part of an egregore, you leave them behind in egregores, or copies of them behind in egregores. They're always part of your of the human collective consciousness or the collective consciousness of the other species which you were part of. Uh, so those are places you can go to reconnect with them. Um, you can often the spirit also um, has um, all the powers which it had in its incarnations before it changed species. Um, so that part of the spirit does not always go into the body, but it uh, is usually connected to the body as the higher self, as the higher consciousness, which uh, can also be accessed by, in a way, uh, going back to the time before you were incarnated. And that's also a place to, to find back all these uh, powers you developed in your incarnations. Um, the uh, higher consciousness uh, usually takes a subset into its incarnation and that subset is usually stored in uh, the upper legs and the pelvic area. 
Um, so spe specifically in the in the thigh bones, in the knees, uh, and a little bit also in the in the pelvic bones. Um, there are a lot of patterns in my seeds for the powers which can reawaken in your uh, in your incarnation. So usually they are not complete powers, but they are more talents which can be awakened, so that the power can be redeveloped quickly. Um, this is usually because uh, how power was used in a previous life is not how it should be used or how it should be used again in your, in your current incarnation because every time, every culture, every incarnation can ask for a different use of that power and you don't want to in a way, over crystallize. Um, some people do have uh, these powers in a crystallized form rather than a, a transformed form. And this has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is, of course, that the power is instantly usable. So you don't have to learn, you don't have to reawaken. Um, the problem is that it is very much set. The power is there in a specific form to, do, to perform a specific purpose. And usually these crystallized powers, these crystallizations are created in uh, working together with gods or goddesses or egregores or other higher powers to create a very strong transformation on the earth. So people like Mozart, uh, Einstein, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, they had very crystallized structures. So in a way all they were creating was already there just waiting to burst forward rather than being purely developed as a, as a raw talent. Okay, then I'll go to the last question of today because it's already getting a little bit late. Um, it's about dragons. Again. <laughs> it's about attraction to dragons and what could I tell about that? Um, so often um, if, if you look a little bit into the, the more original myths, um, the dragon and the serpent are seen as one, and they're seen as, in a way, the, the order, the power which holds the world together, uh, in a way, as the, the, the emissaries, the, the, um, the guardians which are placed upon us by, by the gods, by the higher powers, to make sure we don't do things the wrong way. So in a way they are, um, they are powerful, um, they are uh, alien, uh, but they are also uh, benevolent uh, because they in a way uh, ensure that uh, we don't cross certain boundaries, we don't do the wrong things. But of course as our egos grow and we become less and less attuned to the will of these higher powers, and we started to see dragons and experience dragons as, um, as beings which imprison us, which don't allow us to manifest ourselves fully. Because in a way, yeah, they do, because they keep us in alignment with, with the higher powers. And if we want to drift out of alignment with these higher powers, we want to follow lower powers, go into darkness, other things like that, then they are a danger, then they are a threat um, to be dealt with. Um, and these dragons are um, in a way very uh, akin to nature spirits. Uh, so they all arise from the, from the satanic cosmos. They don't serve one person, they serve an area or a people or uh, a region or a culture. Um, often these dragons will also serve gods or goddesses. Um, the dragons have a very good control over, uh, over elemental energies. They have also um, quite a decent control over, over life force. Um, they tend not to have a lot of control over the higher powers. Um, so even though they are uh, powerful, uh, also their own consciousness is rather limited. They're in a way, uh, servants. They're tasked with a specific task um, and they perform this to, uh, to the best of their ability. Um, when, 
when uh, when working with a, with a dragon, it is really pointless to to try to fight it because um, their their energy bodies are really vast compared to our own energy bodies. Um, and dragons relate very strongly actually to our own lower tree chakras. They're very much about us uh, building up strength and being in harmony. So this is also the areas in which dragons can help us, they can teach us. They cannot help us with developing our minds or developing higher goals or purposes. Uh, but they are very good at stabilizing us and reconnecting us with our own power, with our own essence, with our own spirit, with our own memories from previous incarnations. Uh, also reconnecting with all uh, subconscious powers, with egregores. Um, and what dragons are also trying to do is in a way to give certain parts of the world uh, a specific purpose. So they try to shape the nature of the beings who incarnate in their, in their domain. So what you often find is that uh, people of a certain area, they have a certain nature and even though new people migrate there or move in or are transported in or out, eventually the people there will yeah, develop similar characteristics. And this is because of the dragons who are in a way awakening certain aspects of their, uh, of their lower chakras and guiding them to, to like certain things or to dislike certain things. Um, so they're very much a part of the, of the landscape. Um, dragons can also be very attuned to different elements. You have mountain dragons, you have yeah, sky dragons, you have river dragons, you have dragons which live in lakes. Um, but the dragon is, is more connected to a certain uh, yeah, body of energy it says something about what element he prefers to use but most dragons are expertly skilled in using all elements so they're not limited to it it is just uh, a preference um, dragons are by by nature uh, very protective uh, beings um, and if things are wrong in a certain area they can be called upon to correct it or to help you to correct it. So one of the things is um, uh, close to the Netherlands there's Njord who lives in the North Sea and um, he's very much a dragon who likes purity and um, when things get too polluted, too stagnant, too dirty um, I can call upon him to purify a place and he can do that with, uh, with great ease. Uh, for instance, the city where I live in, uh, Breda, has two rivers flowing in it and it has two water dragons. They're rather small and, and limited, um, but their, uh, their essence is to, in a way, uh, provide uh, activity, prosperity, life force. Uh, so they're very supportive in nature, very um, helping the beings to open up by having a stronger energy body to higher impulses, to, in, to be more inspired, uh, to be in a higher vibration um, than in other places. So uh, getting to know the local dragon uh, tells you a lot about the nature of the place and how the nature of the place could influence you if you work together with the dragon or invite the dragon into your life or into your home. Um, So, I think I should say one more thing about dragons, because dragons are also in a way, often used in a symbolic sense. Um, so in, in the Christian uh, symbolism you have the image of St. George and the dragon, and also you have the uh, initiation belt. Um, and both are in a way uh, symbols of controlling your uh, bottom three chakras. Um, so the initiation belt is a belt which is worn rather high, so kind of like around the, uh, the stomach. And this was often uh, given as a part of a nightly initiation to show that the person has mastered their inner dragon. So they have developed their strength to 
their full potential. Um, but uh, even though they are strong, uh, they are not, their own vibration is not dimmed or limited by having access to all these lower centers. They are never dominant over them. So this is the symbol of the initiation belt. And the uh, symbol of uh, the spear and uh, St. George um, is also about uh, leading the dragon. So St. George is usually depicted as riding on a horse. The horse is the symbol of, of leadership and also of knowledge, of insight. Uh, the spear is uh, the symbol of uh, connecting with lower vibrations. And the dragon is in a way the power of the earth. So it is very much also uh, a, a St. George, as you may know, is also uh, the patron saint of, of yeah, many regions in, uh, in Britain and in Ireland because he is in a way the druid. <laughs> is in a way the, uh, the person who becomes one with the land and leads the land and governs the land in harmony with its people. So it's in a way the priest king, which is uh, symbolized by St. George. Okay, uh, so it's been a bit of a long lesson and we still have questions left over, but I'll just pause to see if there's anything still unclear. And I'll say thank you very much to Anita for your beautiful uh, uh, explanation about the uh, paramita. Uh, but I'll just repeat it here. It is the perfection or completeness in Buddhism. Uh, paramitas refers to the perfection and culmination of certain virtues. And these virtues are cultivated as a method of purification. So thank you very much for uh, that addition, uh, Ninka. And yes, so the, there is also a goddess, in a way, uh, who helps us to develop that, who helps us to, uh, to work with that. So very much akin to, uh, to Sophia in the Western system but quite different.